Hello and welcome to Four Random Books, episode 16. And today is... Well... Time period books. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But these are books which are set up to cover a specific time period. They have... They're bracketed by years. And they're supposed to be encompassing and contain everything within those years. And honestly, I'm going to start with the oldest period, but one of the newest books first. And this is... Warfare at Sea, 1500 to 1650, by Jan Gleek. It's a Rootledge book, and they're very good quality. One of the radical changes of warfare that separates the Middle Ages from modern times is the growth of organizations specialized in warfare. Medieval warfare was based on social institutions, rather than permanent organizations management managed by the state. The feudal level, levy, the local militia on land at sea, the armed merchantman, the city wall, and the private castle were all part of the local and regional power structure, and they might be used against the state as well as against internal and external enemies. The ruler had the right of coordinating the armed forces of the society, but he was not in charge of central administration of the armed forces. He might have ships, weapons, and armed retainers of his own, but so had many local power holders. Armed social institutions, militia, feudal, level act, had for long periods been insufficient or incompatible with the demands of ambitious rulers and threatened societies, but the alternative was not solely permanent organizations run by the state. There was also armed forces leased on the market. The central role of military entrepreneurs and military soldiers in warfare on land from the late Middle Ages until the 17th century is well known. At sea, where ships owned by market-oriented mercantile groups were instruments of warfare, the market might seem the natural solution for the organization of war and protection. On a practical level, armed social institutions, mercenary forces, and permanent armed forces might be complementary. But in a theoretical and long-term perspective on European history, there are competing systems, and we may ask if there are any theory available to explain why centralized armies and navies administered by the state finally become the dominant form. Interesting. Such explanations may be found in organization theories, primarily in ideas derived from Max Weber. Central to Weberian organization theory is the idea that an organization is an instrument for central power holders to exercise power over a large area or a large number of individuals in order to achieve centrally determined aims. The organization must have a system of command and control which gives the center of the hierarchy the power to enforce its orders down to the lowest level of the hierarchy. The organization must be independent of outside and competing socioeconomic interests. The officials of an organization must obey the center of the organization rather than local league groups, and their careers must be determined by their usefulness to the organization and not on socioeconomic connections. The officials of the organization must not appropriate the assets of the organization for private, economic, or political purposes, and they must separate their private affairs and property from those of the organization. They should be salaried officials who identify their goals with the organization. In order to ensure control and continuity, much of the decision process must be documented in writing. Organizations normally produce archives, which make their activities attractive subjects for historians. ADM files and national archives. Woohoo! Historical sociologists who have studied state formations and the rise of early modern bureaucratic states are usually aware of these basic criteria for an organization. The development of the centralized early modern state and its armed forces is a clear example of the separation of a hierarchical organization from the rest of the society. But few, if any, historical sociologists have been interested in latter development of organizational theory and its implications for early modern state formation. It is one thing to say that organizations develop as instruments of power. It does not answer the question why they have proved superior to other forms of power. These questions have been asked by economists who have left the mainstream of their subject and turned to sociology and history in order to explain phenomena which are central to economy. Interesting answers have been given by, among others, Ronald H. Gorse, Herbert Simon, Alfred D. Chandler, and Oliver P. Williamson. To that, I would add Samuel McLean. He is a great historian who is um, the head, chief editor of Global Maritime History, and he's done some absolutely exceptional research in this area. Really worth looking up, but also this book, Jean Gleet. 
Warfare at Sea, 1500-1650. If you're interested in the early formations of not just navies, but nations, this is a great book for that. A really, really great book for that. <coughs> Richard Harding. Sea Power Naval Warfare, 1650-1830. They do match up rather well, that case. Dutch invasion of England, 1688. By any standards, it was a highly unusual operation. In contrast to the bloody battles of the previous 50 years, this major naval operation took place in the fact of a uh, face of a normally, nominally powerful enemy battle fleet without any fighting. It occurred very late in the year and was over in three weeks without any serious uh, secondary action. War between France and the Habsburg Empire was becoming increasingly likely during the summer of 1687, and the stat holder, William III, decided the time was right to invade England and take the throne from his father-in-law, James II. William waited until he was uh, certain that he had significant political support in England, and that Louis XIV had committed himself to a campaign in the Rhineland in September of 1688. Dutch forces had been assembled throughout the summer in expectation of war. 11,000 foot, 4,000 horse were assembled on 250 merchant shipmen while 39 battleships, 26 frigates, 10 fireships, and 20 other vessels provided the escorting battle fleet. The important part of the plan was to avoid battle of the English fleet, which had been assembling in Downs since August. Careful plans had been laid to avoid confrontation. Arthur Herbert, a prominent naval officer with strong following in the English Navy, had come over to Holland early in 1688. He was given overall command of the fleet, with instruction to dissuade the English from attacking. From early August, James was aware of the Dutch preparations. In early October, the fleet of about 37 warships was ready to move to the Nor, and the commander-in-chief, the Earl of Dartmouth, joined the fleet. It was expected that William would attempt a landing in the Nor, but with few sheltered anchorages on this coast, the invasion fleet convoy would be greatly exposed to weather and destruction of uh, pursuing English fleet. It was expected, therefore, that the Dutch would seek battle before the invasion convoy set sail. For the English, the safest course was to force the Dutch to come to them, rather than to seek the enemy on, out on their own coast in winter weather. On 15th October, Dartmouth took the fleet to lie securely behind the Gunfleet sands of the Essex coast to await a further news. James had some experience of commanding at sea in 1665 and 1672. He was aware of the danger and was ready to advise Dartmouth, but the quality of James' information and his reactions to it have been the subject of some controversy amongst historians. On the whole, neither James's intelligence nor his performance after September were adequate. Louis XIV also misread the situation. He knew of the Dutch preparations, but he was determined that they should not interfere with his operations around Phillipsburg or the Rhine. He offered James the support of the Brest Squadron in an attempt to get both the English and Dutch involved in naval war in the Baltic against Sweden. The plan failed, but Louis had completely misunderstood the significance of naval preparations in the North Sea and the role his warships could play. French preparations did not match the Dutch, so that when William finally sailed, the French fleet was in no position to challenge the Dutch. On 1st November, the English Dutch force sailed. Its objective was not the north, but the west coast of England. The eastern, uh, easterly wind, which had been blowing for some days, continued, pinning the English fleet behind the Gunfleet sands. On 3rd of November, the Dutch passed through the Straits of Dover, and Dartmouth finally got the English fleet to sea. William landed at Brixham in Torbay on 5th of November, while Dartmouth reached Beachy Head. Exaggerated accounts of the size of the Dutch fleet and news that the Dutch had landed caused the English Council of War to conclude that an attack would be pointless. Strong westerly winds now forced Dartmouth back to the Downs. It's not until 16 November, with almost preemptory orders from James, that the fleet sailed again. There was a strong possibility that battle would be engaged as the English reached Torbay on 19th November, but bad weather again induced Dartmouth to retire to Spithead, where he waited until it was confident that James II had fled to France and was prudent to submit to the new de facto King of England on the 30th of December. Myself, I would be questioning Dartmouth's allegiance the entire time, but we'll leave that to one side. The curiosity of the campaign lies in the failure of the English fleet to engage the Dutch at any point. Traditionally, this has been distributed to an origin plot within the officer corps. Recent scholars such as David Davis have played down its impact on events and pointed to Dartmouth's natural caution and the very real professional reasons for not engaging Dutch. Dartmouth really wasn't as aggressive as traditional Royal Navy commanders would be. Um... The behaviour of the fleet does, however, leave some intriguing questions. What did naval officers think that their impact on the campaign could be? The decision not to engage because the Dutch had landed suggested they saw their influence events as very limited. William did discharge his transports and had no intention of re-embarking, but the Dutch fleet was exposed well to the westward of its support. 
What did they see as the relationship between sea power and events ashore? This, uh, this, uh, this affection within the army and James's failure in leadership were the critical factors during November. The naval officers decided to wait and see what happened rather than to have any influence upon these faction, the factors. Davis has suggested that this inaction was a reasonable response from career-minded officers who wanted to profit from a change of regime. If this is correct, then it's a good example of decisions being formed not by what sea power could do, but being motivated by simple political opportunism. Sea power, like any form of power, is largely dependent upon an understanding of its capability and a will to use it. A bold Dutch decision to sail directly to a landing place, inaccurate intelligence and adverse winds put the English at this disadvantage after 1st November. However, it's difficult to believe, in light of the Dutch wars, and particularly the English failure to invade Zealand in 1672-3, to free, that the English officers did not understand the limitations of Dutch sea power. They made a judgment about the likely outcome of the land campaign, which they chose not to influence. Ultimately, that was a political, not a military decision. Whether influenced by Orangist plotters, career concerns, or immobilized by the political confusion around them, the decision seems to have been and had two important implications for the perception of sea power. It seems sea power could be disabled relatively easily and decisively. The English Navy suffered from the same parallels as the army. Neither went over to William with enthusiasm, but both were operationally crippled by internal political confusion. The English army was neither large nor well-disciplined by European standards, but a fleet was one of the largest and most professional in the world. There were strong links between the personnel of the army and the Navy officer corps, and it is not surprising that the collapse of morale was similar. However, the breakup of the army and its impact on the campaign was open to doubt much longer than that of the Navy. Cut off from the political news and less influenced by events in other, region, other regions, relatively few decisions made by a small number of officers in Council of War decided the role of the Navy. The army crumbled slowly as decisions made by the king, local magnates, and individual officers accumulated to overwhelm the Stuart position. The inactivity of the fleet may also be have generated the impression that seaborne invasion was much easier than it was. Invasion had not featured particularly in English naval thinking before the 1670s, but it dominated fought thereafter. The battle fleet had grown in the 1650s as an offensive weapon to destroy the Dutch commerce. It evolved to defend English commerce against Corsairs and Dutch and French attacks. Detached cruising or expeditionary squadrons had extended its defensive and offensive capabilities to distant morsels. In the 1670s, the danger of French invasion temporarily gave the fleet an enhanced defensive role, but from 1688, the danger of invasion became a prime motivator in its development. And this book is great because it has paragraphs which go on whole freaking pages. In fact, technically, there's a paragraph which goes from there, all the way down there, to there. So this is where the next paragraph break is. I tell my students off for this. The content of the book is great. The paragraph structures... Mm. Right. Naval Warfare, 1815-1940 by Lawrence Sondhans. European navies during the American Civil War. Considering the law, episode 14, I thought this would be appropriate. Throughout the American Civil War, the British Navy maintained its usually unusually large squadrons at Halifax and Bermuda, but sent no armoured warships across the Atlantic. While some private shipbuilders laid down warships for the Confederacy, others joined the Royal Dockyards in continuing to build ironclads for the British fleet. In Britain, as elsewhere in Europe, news of the Battle of Hampton Roads has spelled lingering scepticism about armoured warships and touched off a debate between proponents of monitors and those of armoured frigates. Britain built both types, usually ordering and actually ordering its first turret ship in February 1862, before the Monitor made its debut at Hampton Roads. The 3,690-ton masterless coastal ironclad Prince Albert was fitted with Coles turrets, designed by Captain Comper Coles and patented in 1859, which turned on rollers below deck level, in contrast to Ericsson's turret, which was mounted on top of the deck and turned on a central spindle. The ship featured an iron hull, seven feet of freeboard, and four centerline turrets, each mounting a single nine-inch gun. Laid down in April 16, 1862 and completed in February 1866, it remained on the effective list for 33 years. Rather unusual for a ship of that age in that period. At the same time, the screw ship of the line, Royal Sovereign, a three-decker built in 1849-57, to was converted to a master's turret ship between April 1862 and August 1864. Like the Prince Albert, it had four centerline turrets, only with 10.5-inch ordnance and bow turret, and the bow turret mounted in, mounting a second gun. 
The next turret ships in the British Navy were the Laird Ironclad, Scorpion Winnerven, intended for the Confederacy but seized by British government in October 1863 and commissioned two years later. Other British turret ships of the area included eight large monitors for coastal operations laid down in 1867 to 17, ranging in size from 2,900 to 4,910 tons. Britain's first high seas battleship with turrets, the 800,320 ton Monarch, built 1866 to 69, a fully rigged warship with the appearance of a large broadside armoured frigate. It carried its primary armament, four 12 inch guns, paired in two centre line turrets amidship. The concept was related in the 7,750 ton Captain, built 1867 to 70, which featured a lower freeboard of just six and a half feet. It capsized and sank in a gale off Cape Finisterre in September 1870, while on service with the Channel Fleet. Coles was among the 472 men lost in the disaster. Really wasn't big. It was very high risk at this time. Final one. The War and the Navy at War, 1939 to 1945, by Captain S. W. Roskill. Always enjoy a nice frost call. The German battle cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau and the heavy cruiser Hipper, whom we last encountered during the raid against the ships returning from Narvik at the end of the Norwegian campaign, remained in Trondheim until the Scharnhorst had effected temporary repairs to the damage received by the torpedo fired by the Acastle in defence of the glorious 8th of June. On 20th of that month, the two battle cruisers put to sea to return to Germany, but Neisenau was promptly torpedoed by the submarine Clyde which was patrolling off the Norwegian coast and put back into port. Our sister ship, however, successfully ran the gauntlet of our submarine and air patrols and reached Kiel safely on the 23rd. A month later, the Neisenau and several lesser warships also returned to Germany, where both battlecruisers docked to repair their battle damage. Only the Hipper showed activity in July and August, when she made an abortive foray into Arctic waters. Then now followed a lull of about three months, during which nearly all the large German surface ships were in their home waters. Though RAF bombers made numerous attacks on Kiel and Wilhelmshaven, they failed to inflict any serious damage on them. While preparing its major warships for further forays against our ocean shipping, the German Navy did not, however, leave the Atlantic battleground entirely to U-boats and bombers. Ever since the early days of the war, carefully selected merchantmen had been secretly converted to armed raiders, and by the middle of 1940, the first five, the Atlantis, Orion, Wider, Tor, and Penguin, were all at sea, and before the end of the year, they'd be joined by two others, the Comet and Comorin. The disguised raiders were formidable ships, armed with six to eight modern guns and torpedo tubes, and in most cases, they carried one or two aircraft for reconnaissance purposes. Germans not only provided them with very careful aids to disguise, but arranged secret rendezvous in remote parts of the ocean, where they could refuel and replenish from supply ships with little fear of interruption. They all employed similar tactics, attacking only single merchantmen, whom they either lured within range by simulating friendliness or sprang upon suddenly by night. As soon as one zone had become dangerous to them, they changed their disguise and shifted to a new cruising ground. From a British point of view, they presented a very difficult problem, for they were exceedingly hard to locate and only a cruiser was sufficiently well armed to deal with them. Through the Central and South Atlantic, long remained their favourite uh, hunting grounds, several appeared in the Indian Ocean and even further afield in 1940. Buster Comet reached the, the Pacific by making, with the assistance of Russian icebreakers, a remarkable passage along the north coast of Siberia. Stalin really did give Hitler so much help in the beginning of World War II. Seriously, so much help during the beginning of World War II. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Four Random Books. I certainly did. And, um, so yeah, that's time periods. Take care.